Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here for today's video. We are going to dive deep. Do I say dive deep in every video? Get a thesaurus. What does a dinosaur have to do with it? We're going to break down the idea of going from one crop to another crop without tillage and keeping the garden in a sort of perpetual state of production or as close to that as possible. Uh, this will include crop removal techniques, transplanting and seeding tips, dad jokes, fertilizing, a little interplanting, and more. So let's freaking go. Your dinosaur told me that is a synonym for let's do it. First things first, if you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. And usually this is where I would ask you to join our Patreon page or buy a copy of the Living Soil Handbook. But this week, please consider supporting our farming friends in Eastern Kentucky who have been absolutely devastated by the recent flooding in our state. This will be an ongoing issue for many, many months and years to come. Uh, you can chip in by going to this website here for the Central Appalachian Family Farm Fund and helping show some love to my fellow Kentuckians in the wake of this devastating flooding in 2022. Um, I'll put the link in the show notes as well. Seriously, thank you. Okay, so it's mid to late summer as I record this, depending on where you are. Uh, I mean, I guess unless you're in the Southern Hemisphere, it's almost spring there for you. But for us, the main season is slowly winding down and we are frantically flipping beds going from summer to late summer crops or summer crops to fall crops. So here's what that looks like in the no-till slash living soil context. First, not every no-till bed flip can be treated exactly the same. This is because the termination of the previous crop, unless it was something like beets or radishes or carrots that just come fully out when you harvest them, that termination must be accomplished before you can plant something else. In essence, the previous crop must die entirely, but with one caveat. Uh, you want to leave the roots of almost any crop that is not a root crop in the soil absolutely as much as reasonably possible. Uh, yes, the first principle is leave the roots in the garden as much as you can. This is because roots contain an enormous amount of carbon, of microbes, of soil particles, of water, of nutrients, etc. Um, I weighed the root balls of winter spinach plants once, and they came out to roughly 0 0.03 pounds. I calculated that for that particular 100-foot bed, I would be removing upwards of 40 pounds of material or more from the soil, from one bed. And of course, lots of roots are much larger than spinach roots. I point this out because how we used to flip beds, and certainly how some growers do, is to pull every plant out entirely or till the whole thing up and wait for it to break down. But by leaving the roots in there, we're leaving the structure and everything that the previous crop earned through photosynthesis, right where it was. Um, sure, some high percentage of the root is water, but remember that water is not just water inside of a root system. Water is the transportation mechanism for nutrients and microbes, so with the water goes a lot of good stuff. Am I digressing? I feel like I'm digressing a little bit. The first goal for many crops is to leave the roots in the soil and remove the above ground plant matter, the above ground biomass, uh, usually to the compost pile. But as you'll see, there are certain times you can just leave that material, the above ground biomass, where it lies. Uh, for crops like lettuce, they can be cut right at the soil surface uh, to kill them. For brassicas like kale that grow back fairly easily, you want to cut them below the soil surface, uh, usually with a pair of garden shears or loppers like this. There are, of course, exceptions to leaving the roots in the ground beyond root crops. For instance, uh, for things like radicchio that grow back extremely easily, that whole chicory family does, um, you will want to remove that whole root when you are ready to flip that bed, unless you are growing on landscape fabric, in which case you can simply move the landscape fabric a little bit, uh, which will smother that plant and prevent it from coming back and allow you to plant something else. Shout out to Howard Allen from Faithful Farms for that tip. Note that I do a whole list of which crops should be cut at what level in the Living Soil Handbook. If you're interested, link is in the profile. And of course, books are always way more detailed than videos could ever be. Anyway, we usually just cut plants out by hand, but sometimes if the bed does not have a lot of weeds in it, we will effectively pull any weed that does exist and then mow the bed with our flail mower set very low. So it is essentially attacking just above the soil surface. This will not kill 100% of the previous crop. Our number one weed most years is whatever was in the bed before, but it's usually such a low percentage of the previous crop returning 
that it's easy to just pick them out or leave them because they don't aren't really hurting anything. In this scenario, with the flail mower, we mow, then we rake, and then we replant, typically with transplants. For transplanting, yes, the previous crop's roots can get in the way uh, a bit, but I just plant beside any roots that were there. For direct sowing, I have found that the Jane Cedar with the double disc opener is the best option as it will simply slice through the stems. Um, if you just have a normal shoe on your cedar, you will probably have to just go around the roots. And if you're trying to sow something dense like baby greens, you may just have to cut the roots out lower than you normally would an inch or so below the surface, just so you're not running into them with the cedar. Now, you may be going from a light feeder to a heavy feeder or you may just not be happy with how the previous crop performed and need to fertilize in some fashion. Uh, fertilizing is a little more tricky since we will be not be tilling the beds, thus working in any material you add. If you have a tilter or a power harrow, that can sort of mix the amendment into the soil at an inch or two down, uh, which is good. If you're doing transplants, you can add a small handful of nice compost to the transplant hole this compost addition can really get plants off to a good start as long as it's good and fully mature compost and the rest of the bed is not in too bad of shape nutritionally or in terms of compaction. Um, in certain circumstances, I will use the Earthway Seeder with the lima bean plate or pea plate, uh, one of the larger plates, to distribute dry fertilizer like alfalfa meal. And I will just push that down the middle of the bed wherever I have space and allow it to kind of put that amendment underneath of the soil surface. You can also simply spread whatever fertilizer or amendment it is um, over top and rake it in. Here in Kentucky, we get a lot of rain and most stuff, even rock minerals, can percolate down into the soil. Um, in situations where you do not get ridiculously heavy rainfalls like we do, you may want to lightly work any amendments into the top inch or so. Also, and apologies if this is just word salad at this point, but you likewise have the option of spreading the fertilizing mix over top of the bed and seeding directly over that. Uh, for more densely planted seeds, the seeder will effectively press the compost mix or whatever it is into the soil. That way it gets underneath of the soil and that makes it more effective, more accessible to your plants. Leaving any amendments sitting on the surface, however, is not a good idea. Uh, they can blow away or if it's carbonaceous stuff like alfalfa meal, they'll just maybe burn up in the sun. So anyway, that kind of covers amending more or less. Like always, feel free to let me know what your strategy is in the comments or any questions you have or any things you do differently or anything I get wrong. All fair game. What else did I promise to talk about? Interplanting. Uh, one thing I do is that if I have a crop ready to go out into the field, like summer squash, but the bed that it's going into still has some production left in it, uh, like this lettuce, I will simply go ahead and put the squash into the lettuce bed. And then once I get my last cutting of off the lettuce, I can cut the lettuce out and the squash will take over the bed. We call this relay cropping and squash is weirdly tolerant for this for having such sensitive root systems. I have, for instance, transplanted young squash into mature carrot beds and then pulled the carrots. Um, this spring, I transplanted zucchinis into cilantro, like overwintered cilantro, overwinters really well, then later cut the cilantro out and had a wonderful patch of zucchini there. Other crops are not always as excited about this, like this chard that was planted between some lettuce. Uh, I'm reviving it now with a little coaxing, i.e. some compost. But if you're going to play with this idea of relay cropping, just start small, trial some things, see what works. Um, some crops in some situations will just not love it. Uh, of course, my ideal garden is where no time is wasted between photosynthesizing plant and photosynthesizing plant. That's not always possible, or at least not always practical. But I do think it's important to emphasize that plants are the most important food your soil can have ever, pumping in carbonaceous goodies for the soil life. One issue though, and I, I kind of already said this, is you just don't want to plant into a bed that is suffering from compaction, which may have also been the case with the chard. The lettuce was okay, but it wasn't great. So yeah, you may, if the bed seems compacted, wait until the previous crop is out, broad fork and lightly rake and prepare it however you want to, um, and then replant. Um, compaction and other issues are usually apparent if the previous crop did not do so well. And if it just isn't quite coming together, you can always cover crop it. Uh, cover crops are great for getting beds in line and breaking up compaction. And speaking of continuous gardening and cover crops, you can see the uh, green around that cabbage plant. 
is crimson clover that I've under sowed and it's basically under all of these plants. Cabbage and Brussels and all sorts of stuff. What's up chicken? And the idea of there being that after that cabbage is gone, the crimson clover will take over the bed and keep fertilizing it over the winter and at which point we will have really awesome uh, cover crop. But I'm not going to go into cover crops too much in this video. Uh, for info on going from cover crops to cash crops, uh, watch this playlist here. Now, what if you've got a bed with weeds? Uh, this year we did not buy any compost for mulching literally bought zero outside compost because I don't really like the compost we have access to and stories of persistent herbicides and forever chemicals have me a little on edge, not gonna lie. Uh, so with the mulch layers we established last year being mildly depleted at this point, we have started to run into more weed issues. I may have gotten a little used to that whole not cultivating thing over the last few years. So how does one deal with that in any sort with any sort of efficiency um, and without a lot of disturbance? Well, some weeds can be cut out uh, at the soil surface, but with grasses and most weeds, honestly, you mostly want to remove the whole plant to not risk them returning, um, including the roots. So you would either go through and pull out the grasses if it won't take that long, or on a larger scale, we pick out all the weed seed heads, if there are any, uh, then we mow. Then we take the power harrow and lightly cultivate the surface just enough to break the weeds from their roots. And then we rake and plant. Keep in mind the power harrow is only going uh, a couple inches down, not down to the root zone where the majority of microbes and structures are and where we really need to protect the soil. You can also use a tilter, this tool here, or just a stirrup hoe for this job. In the heat of the summer though, if you have the tools, do not sacrifice yourself or your employees for idealism. Just use the most effective tool you can. Minimize dis the disturbance as much as you possibly can. Get the bed cleared and then replant it quickly. As long as you follow the basic living soil principles, the soil will be fine, I promise. Uh, more important is not burning yourself out or burning out your employees so that you can keep stewarding the soil year after year. Last thing I'll mention, I think it's the last thing, is baby greens. This is always a big question. When there are so many roots in the soil, how do you manage that? How do you manage to go from one crop to another? You actually have a few options and I like them all pretty similarly. The first approach is to simply pick your weeds out, mow it lightly, apply some nutrients, decide if you need to break up the compaction, uh, work the surface lightly. Again, with a light harrowing or a tilter or a hoe. And then after that, you replant it. So that's a more labor intensive but fast option. Uh, the slower but less labor intensive option is to mow it, cover it with some fresh compost, get it very wet, then cover the bed with landscape fabric or a opaque tarp for a few days. Um, I don't have video examples of this exactly, so you'll have to use your imagination a bit, but I think the idea is simple enough. You're letting the microbes break down the previous crop residue and the tarp or fabric is helping to hold the moisture in to enable the microbes to do their thing. Then you can just rake it and plant or seed whatever you plan to do next. Not to get redundant, but like I said, the ideal is to go from one crop to another as fast as possible. The reality is though, sometimes that's not going to work and the bed will simply be out of production for a few days. In worst case scenario, you can always cover an area with a tarp for a while to clear debris. Don't beat yourself up too much for leaving a bed out of production uh, for a small period of time. We almost all do it. Uh, farming is hard and it simply happens sometimes.
One last question that may come up, can you simply top a garden bed with a bunch of compost or some other mulch after a crop comes out and plant directly into that sort of no dig style? In many cases, yes. Just know that grasses and things like dock can poke through. They get through almost any mulch. Uh, I would get rid of the weeds first and then add the mulch layer. We tarp and then we pull the tarp and then we add compost or we add a mulch over top of that. So we tarped the beds, we let the weeds break down and then we added our mulch and then we planted. If nothing else, getting rid of the weeds first is, you know, nice insurance. Uh, anyway, add your insight and thoughts on bed flipping and continuous gardening in the comments section. Consider giving a bit to the Central Appalachian Family Farm Fund through CFA. Link is in the profile. Uh, like this video if you like this video. Sign up to be a patron at patreon.com slash no-till growers. Or you can also support this work by picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook from notillgrowers.com, specifically where the proceeds go to making you more content like this or podcasts or all sorts of stuff. Otherwise, thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye.